Well, the theme of my last video was, to sum it up, just when you thought you had things figured out, you don't have things figured out. We aren't at the end of history. Liberal democracy and capitalism have not triumphed and won over the entire globe. There seems to be a growing instinctual rev revulsion to the way of life that that uh, system represents. A lot of it can be lumped under the general category of identity. And various movements, though they can be at each other's throats, as for instance, the social justice warriors are against the anti-social justice warriors, and the ethno-nationalists are against the classical liberal holdouts and the moral conservatives. But a lot of these movements circle around identity or finding some higher purpose and meaning, something that uh, can make a person's life meaningful. Uh, we appear to not be satisfied even if we have all the material things we want and we have relative security and stability. Uh, it matters not. People who commit violence come from every class and for the most part those that are the most violent as far as the mass shootings go in this country um, have been not from the poorest of the poor. I remember listening to Dan Carlin, uh, most famous for his hardcore history podcast, on his Common Sense podcast, just sounding, it was about a year ago, in 2017, uh, sounding like he was completely lost. He knew a lot of history, but he really didn't quite understand what was going on. He had a feeling that things were not going well and that our institutions were failing. So he had kind of, kind of a gut level feeling about it, but he couldn't articulate it further. And actually, if you go back and you look at the, uh, the podcasts uh, before the one I'm going to play a little, a little snippet from, um, like two or three podcasts before, he's even more confused sounding than he is here. Carlin was just uh, outraged and didn't really understand what to make of it, um, all these various things that are going on in our world. So listen to this. But the Peggy Noonan column is interesting because, well, let me read you a little bit of it, because remember, this is, this is the establishment here talking, and this is how they see it now. This is not tinfoil hat stuff. This is um, current sober analysis by places like the Wall Street Journal, which advise you on where to put your money and whatnot. Um, she writes the beginning of the June 15th, 2017 piece at the Journal. I encourage you to go take a look if you haven't seen it. Quote, what we are living through in America is not only a division, but a great estrangement. It is between those who support Donald Trump and those who despise him, between left and right, between the two parties, and even to some degree, between the bases of those parties and their leaders in Washington. It is between the religious and those who laugh at your make-believe friend, between cultural progressives and those who wish not to have progressive ways imposed upon them. It is between the coasts and the center, between those in flyover country and those who decide what flyover will watch on television next season. It's between, I accept the court's decision and bake my cake. We look down on each other, fear each other, increasingly hate each other, end quote. Then she talks about what we've talked about in this program too, what a lot of other people have too, that there's a machine in this country that gives the people what they want and what they want according to the consultants and the people who analyze this stuff and, and spend hours breaking down programming on things like radio stations and whatnot. People want heat, they want anger, they want controversy, they want somebody to focus you know, their dissatisfaction on as part of the problem, which is why you've been pushing this stuff for more than 20 years hard for ratings, for clicks, for views, for likes, for retweets. What's the effect of that? Well, Noonan says from the middle of the piece, quote, that's what we're doing now, exciting the unstable, not only with images, but with words and on every platform. It's all too hot and revved up. This week we had a tragedy. If we don't cool things down, we'll have more, end quote. Okay, this is a good place for us to be in terms of the sitting back, analyzing the problem stage. 
Because once we agree, okay, this is the downward slope of a roller coaster ride. We may have been coasting on a plateau for a while, but everybody can see that unless something changes, we are heading towards more. We don't know what more is. We don't know who more will come from. We don't know who more will be directed at. But unless something changes, it is logical to expect current trends to continue. And for every incident that happens to add fuel to the fire, you know, that precipitates the next incident. This is a cycle. As I said, you get into a dynamic here. I think that was uh, made shortly after that guy shot at senators during a practice baseball game. Anyway, you might think if somebody as intelligent and talented as, as Dan Carlin, who knows so much about history, doesn't really know what's behind these, these types of things um, and what he, what he calls the, the sort of the hatred that people are feeling for each other, what I would call the tribalization of people, um, who, who would be able to figure it out? Well... I think this is where political philosophy can come in handy. I don't think I have all the answers, but there's a lot of sources out there in political philosophy that, that do tell us a lot. Um, and what I want to do is maybe spend some time tonight, maybe in the next week or two, I, I will do some more of this, delving into some of the insightful political philosophers who've, who've who in their own way have tried to figure this out. And uh, the one that I want to talk about tonight is Charles Taylor. Now, these quotes are from his book, A Secular Age. I actually got these quotes from a, um, a blog called Tilth and Titivation. Um, and I will put a link to that blog down in my information. I'd recommend it. Uh, the author of the blog puts up... Uh, selections from some some great books almost every week um, gives a lot of food for thought they tend to be aimed at uh, trying to figure out as the theme of this goes uh, what's going on we can spend all day watching the news we can spend all day you know thinking and talking about the latest kind of weird wild hair thing that happened and is getting reported constantly on CNN or we can take a long step back and we can try to see the bigger picture. I would recommend detaching a bit from the hour by hour news and doing a little bit more reading of things like, uh, you know, the selections on this blog. Um, so in this particular part of a secular age, Charles Taylor is trying to explain the emergence of the concept of the sublime in the 18th century. And, and typical Charles Taylor, um, if the first time you read this, you will be wondering, what the heck, you know, wh why is he even writing about this? What's the savant? What does that mean? Um, you, you have to read Charles Taylor probably like four times to, to begin to figure out exactly where he's headed. But the cool thing is it's, it's worth it. Um, now, I became acquainted with the concept of the sublime by reading Burke on the sublime, um, Edmund Burke. And Taylor does, uh, does refer to Burke in this little selection. Um, Burke was an 18th century uh, English conservative. And uh, so what I gather from reading Burke's book is that the sublime has to do with those vast, huge, amazing forces, typically forces of nature, um, that, that are awe-inspiring and fear-inspiring. And they have this, um, uh, you know, mesmerizing attraction. Um, such would be like watching the volcano as it explodes in Hawaii and all the lava and just, or, um, you know, I got this feeling once watching a stealth bomber fly over a baseball stadium uh, it's a frightening, powerful thing that at the same time is ex it's, it's thrilling to see. Anyway, this was a big theme um, starting with uh, Burke, and it was a theme that was developed in, in the 19th century as well. Well, as you know, if you've been listening to the 
um, to this channel for a while, Taylor writes a lot about the disenchantment um, that got started with the Scientific Revolution and the uh, Protestant Reformation um, and then with industrialization. These, these uh, major events in modernity uh, made it more difficult for people to, to believe in a world beyond what they could see. And they developed this so-called buffered self so that, so that they did not have these direct numinous experiences um, of a spiritual nature, uh, of, of a highly emotional nature, um, because they, they, they had rationalized and themselves out of it and they had changed their values around um, and their goals. Uh, so for instance, from, from holiness to uh, you know, material prosperity. Well, um, Taylor argues that in earlier times, wild, open spaces, the wilderness, for instance, think of the wilderness as it's featured in the Bible, you know, as, as a, it represents everything frightening, everything dark, everything evil. But as human beings conquered the wild places, they were demysticized. And they didn't have this highly charged spiritual dimension to them anymore. In other words, people weren't able to encounter either God or Satan in those wild places, and they didn't represent uh, those, um, those feelings anymore. So the raw fear of the wilderness was neutralized, or as Taylor says, the, the horror was neutralized by the disenchantment of the world and the development of a buffered self. He says the agent of disengaged reason was no longer got to by the eternal silences of alien vastness. And that, that he means that really directly. In other words, the person who had kind of become the enlightened um, modern man was no longer vulnerable to being hit by uh, you know, absolute terror, abject fear, um, you know, based upon experience of wilderness. Wild places, to the extent that they existed, were being conquered. He says wild places were exercised, exercised of their spirits. Okay? The scary legends connected to them were debunked by humanist thinkers. Mountains and plains were harmonized brought together in the single ordered space of maps and scientific theory. You know, it's been a long time, so it's kind of hard to imagine even, but truly he's right that the wild places were thought by people and still are by primitive people to be uh, full of spirits, um, spiritually charged, powerful, uncontrollable. But when people discovered that they could control that they could cut down, that they could map, that they could utilize, then those wild places didn't hold that anymore for them. And this was part of what developed that buffered self that could not be gotten to, could not be, in other words, visited by those, those frightening but vivifying spirits. But he says a bit later, but the horror returns, albeit in a different register. And what he's referring to is this development of this new category of the sublime. Now, it, it's, that term can be confusing because if you hear it used in ordinary parlance, it usually is meant, you know, something like um, really perfect or, you know, very, very pleasant. And there is a pleasure in the sublime but this has to do with the type of pleasure that comes from fearful awesomeness, like that stealth bomber. So that's when people started to manufacture their horror. So he points out that art and literature, you know, be it in, I'm sure, music as well. I don't think he mentions that. 
started to try to create a sort of semblance of this horror and terror of raw nature and the spiritual charge, but in a tamed way, in a controlled way. So, I mean, think about, you know, going to the movies and watching the latest uh, horror movie. Um, it's scary, but it's, it's, it's scary in a planned way. It's not terrifying. And so this is the sort of popular per, uh, pursuit of the, uh, the feeling of the sublime. In other words, Taylor is saying, we still need to have this experience. We still long for it. There is an enlivening nature in having this experience. And the modern world cuts us off from this experience that, that, that in a previous conversation, when talking about Jung, uh, we called the numinous experience, right? In the modern world then, Taylor notes that people felt like they were missing something. And this pursuit of the sublime was supposed to be somewhat of an answer to it. Uh, but it's, it's a... It's a shadow of the former, uh, the former experience. Here we have him discussing the loss. Um, he says, pursuing the goods of life and prosperity while eschewing enthusiasm in a world designed especially to favor these ends seemed to make life shallow, devoid of deep resonance and meaning. It seemed to exclude transports of devotion, of self-giving, to deny a heroic dimension to our existence. It reduces us by enclosing us in a too rosy picture of the human condition, shorn of tragedy, irreparable loss, meaningless suffering, cruelty, and horror. Now, uh, I would just add to this that it encloses us in this picture that's a fiction, and that's what that's what Taylor is, is implying there. This is a fiction. Uh, the Enlightenment, progressive, materialist position is that we can get rid of tragedy, that we can somehow erase loss, you know, maybe through psychotherapy, maybe through legislation, maybe through economic development, that we can do away with suffering and cruelty and horror with our planning, with our technical rationality. But lo and behold, our world has as much of these things, if not more, than ever before. But we are in the grips of this idea, or were for quite some time, that, that, that we had this under control, and that if not perfectly under control, we in time would be able to maybe even conquer death itself. We aren't allowed, in other words, we don't allow ourselves to experience the real human condition, which is full of tragedy, loss, suffering, cruelty, and horror. It's a neat psychological trick, and it really happens all the time. It buffers us from that reality, from those realities, which are still sublime in that old-fashioned sense, and enlivening. And since we are cut off from that, we feel somehow our life is shallow, as he said, devoid of deep resonance and meaning. We exclude transports of devotion. You know, transports of devotion meaning, again, the numinous experience of, of uh, you know, having this moment, this moment of, of being more or less visited from another world from, from something beyond ourselves and above ourselves. We are excluded from self-giving or heroism. And, and so these, these dimensions of the human experience are pushed out. And heroism, glory, self-sacrifice, these are all way too risky. Human technique uh, should and, and does try to get rid of them all. But the price that we pay, I think is what Taylor is saying, is the price that we pay for that is boredom, in a way. It's, it's meaninglessness. 
it's a sort of desperation to try to find the meaning that we've lost because we don't want to confront the incredible, vast, mysterious, sublime power of the world around us. We want to live in our cocoon with our story that tells us that we've got everything under control. Here he says, we are tempted to draw the limits of our life too narrowly, to be concerned exclusively with a narrow range of internally generated goals. In doing this, we are closing ourselves to other greater goals. These might be seen as originating outside of us from God or from the whole of nature or from humanity, or they might be seen as goals which arise indeed within, but which push us to greatness, heroism, dedication, devotion to our fellow human beings, and which are now being suppressed and denied. Here I might uh, focus in on that uh, part of the quote that says, from the whole of nature, because as, as pointed out before, nature was the original source of this sort of um, awe-inspiring fear. Um, and it still could be. Uh, we are dealing with changes not only in our political and social climate, but also in the, uh, the actual physical climate of our planet that are pretty, pretty uh, amazing and frightening uh, and call us to more or less realize that we, that we, we don't have everything under control. But but that, and maybe that's why people are so sensitive to the subject of um, global warming and, and, and climate change. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we have folks that say that human beings are so in control that the climate is completely um, more or less affected by, the, by human beings. Um, there are people on the other side uh, who deny that human beings have anything to do with the climate and it's not changing. So we can continue to do whatever we want uh, to the planet without any repercussions. Both of those positions seem to see nature as something that can be manipulated by human beings. And it's a question of how it ought to be manipulated. It's kind of rare to find somebody now who's genuinely uh, awe-inspired and frightened by nature no matter what it does unless of course you're standing next to that volcano in Hawaii. Sure you might be awe-inspired by looking into the Grand Canyon but I'm talking about like the type of fear and horror and just spiritual energy that was felt by folks long ago that Charles Taylor is talking about. I don't think we can even wrap our heads around it. Human beings now always go to what can we do to fix or what can we do to exploit? But very rarely do they think of nature as something that is almost an entity of its own with its own more or less attitude. Um, that's, that's something that we have gotten away from. We have become modern enough that we don't think of it that way. But yet from a certain angle, it is asserting itself, and it is unpredictable. The larger point that Taylor is trying to make is that too much modernization, too much control, too much mapping, too much technical rationality has produced an alienation from this, this, this feeling of otherness and of, of the visitation of things above and beyond ourselves and we long for it and so we created the sublime and we 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 try to generate it in our entertainment in our art music but that's not good enough he says as a consequence a commonly understood image of a remedy to this ill was the breaking in on this narrow self-absorption of some larger purpose and that's what we've been talking about in the 20th century that larger purpose became the fascist movement, the Nazi movement, the communists, and then later on with the triumph of liberal democracy and capitalism over communism, you know, the Western world too had its own larger purpose 
of spreading democracy and democratizing the world and making the world safe for capitalism. And just as with the sublime, we have found that the results are ultimately not satisfying enough to actually create the conditions in which people can live in harmony um, and be happy. But we get new ideologies, new attempts to try to find something higher, bigger, better, and that's what a lot of these ideologies popping up today are trying to do. We get a sort of hero worship. Different figures, figures from various worlds of music, entertainment, and politics. We haven't gotten away from the idea that there can be a heroic figure that can kind of swoop down and save us all. Someone who's bigger and better and more more talented and and more powerful than we could ever be. So from this perspective, what's going on is a reactivation of the desire for more meaning, for a higher purpose, and for something greater than we perceive ourselves to be because our world has become real circumscribed. We become earners of a wage. We have become consumers. We have become a variety of roles that our society tells us we need to fill. We become very boxed in. There's very little freedom. From birth to death, we are living with a great deal of control and pressure um, perf to, to perform, to earn, to you know obtain a certain status to buy things, to fit in. I mean, now we have Facebook and Instagram, you know, to remind us how to fit in. And what the hell is all that for? It doesn't make us happy. So I think this is part of what's going on. I know that may not be terribly satisfying. Maybe it seems a little too simple. Hopefully it seems simple if I've explained it halfway well. But I think there's a boredom and a weariness um, at this point at the so-called end of history that is an ending, where we do feel like last men. I don't think people like being last men. 